Hi, Yura. So in this video, we're discussing about the IELTS listening. We have already discussed the IELTS reading type of question. We have discussed all the different question types and we have also looked at the sample question. And we have already completed the IELTS study task 1. We have looked at the different question types and I have also looked at the sample answer. So in case of IELTS listening, understanding what they are telling is very, very important. The way the British people and Americans speak is completely different because their accent is completely different and with the way they pronounce the words is also completely different. So you will have to spend one to two hours every day just listening to the English conversations. This is very very important. You can watch movies, animated movies, etc. Every day you have to spend one to two hours just listening to English conversations. First we'll not understand, but later we'll completely understand what they are telling. Once you listen to their conversations, you will understand the pronunciation. Once you understand the pronunciation, you will understand the meaning of the sentence. Once you understand the meaning, you will be able to answer the question. So every day you have to spend 1 to 2 hours listening to English conversations. First, we are discussing the different question types and then we will be solving it in a test paper. In case of IELTS listening, all the different question types, you have to mark the important keywords. This is very, very important. And whatever the speaker is telling, you have to completely follow the speaker. For example, the speaker is telling about competition. Your pencil should be in that particular sentence. This is very, very important in use of IELTS listening. And before attending the question, we'll have to clearly look at what is the question type, what is the word limit, how many words you can write, can you write a number or not. We'll have to check for all the instructions before attending the question. And in case of IELTS listening, you don't have to write anything. You just have to follow and completely understand what the speaker is telling. So here you can see they have done the complete the notes type of question. You have to read the heading and you'll have to mark all the important keywords. And when the speaker is telling about the writing engineer, the pencil should be in that particular sentence. Here the answer is book. So here you'll be clearly writing the answer book. And you'll have to write the exact same word what the speaker is telling. If the speaker is telling books, you will have to write it as books. If the speaker is telling it as book, you will have to write it as book. This is very important. You will have to write the exact word what the speaker is telling. You have to quickly write the answer and then you will be following the speaker. And then when you get the second answer, you will be writing the second answer and then you will be following the speaker. So this is about the complete the notes table question. Then comes the MCQ type of questions. You will have to mark all the important keywords both in the in the question and also in the different options. And for example, first they are telling about the healthcare industry. Then they are telling it is not the healthcare industry. So you will have to completely eliminate the options. This is also very very important in case of MCQ. So you will have to eliminate the options and you will be looking for the rest of the options what they have below. So this is very very important. You will have to mark all the important keywords both in the question and in the options and eliminating the options is also very very important in case of MCQ type of question. And then comes label the map. In case of label the map, you have to read the heading, mark all the important, mark all the important locations in the map. You will have to look for if there is a corridor. You will have to look for what are the nearby locations what they have given. You will have to look for where the doors are located. You will have to look where from where you can enter and from where you can exit. You will have to clearly look all these in the map. And in case of map, when they are telling us a particular location, they will tell minimum two keywords. For example, when they are telling about the location H, they have told two keywords. One is about the trees and second one is the main road. So what you will have to do is, you will have to quickly write those keywords near to that particular question using the right hand and using the left hand, you will be completely following the speaker. You have to write the keywords near the question. You can write it in short also. Using your right hand, you will be writing all the keywords near the question. And using your left hand, you will be following what the speaker is telling. So this is about the label the map type of question. Then comes MCQ questions with multiple answer. Here also, we have to go through the questions, mark all the important keywords. You will have to go through the options, mark all the important keywords. And you will have to eliminate the options. So for example, they are saying bird. Park, visit is not the answer, you have to completely eliminate it and you will have to look for the rest of the options what they have given. Then comes matching type of questions. In case of matching type of questions, you have to first read the heading and then you have to mark all the important keywords in the options and you have to look through the questions also. And here you can see they have given the question number is 25, 26, 27, 28. 
So here we'll be writing it as 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. Why we are writing it as 1, 2, and 3? Because it will be easy for us to remember the question number and we will be easily able to write the question numbers here. For example, they are telling the falcon. For the falcon, the answer is a potential threat. So we will be writing here it as 1. For example, the second answer is the power of color. So here we will be writing it as 2. So when you are writing the question numbers as 1, 2, 3, you will be easily able to remember, you will easily remember the question number and you will be easily able to write those question numbers near these options. And when the speaker starts speaking, your right hand should be near the options and you must be quickly going through the different options. Using your left hand, you must go through the questions. So this is about the matching type of question. Then comes the complete the notes type of question. This we have already discussed. Next we have complete the form type of question. Here also, you have to mark all the important keywords. Mark all the important keywords. And when the speaker starts speaking, you have to completely follow what the speaker is telling. You have to write the answer and again follow the speaker. Then you have matching type of questions here. You can choose the letter more than once. So here also you will have to go through the different options. Mark all the important keywords. Go through the different questions. Here you can say they have given the numbers as 21, 22, 23. So here we will be writing it as 1, 2, 3. As I said before, we are writing it as 1, 2, and 3 because it will be easy for us to remember the question number and write it near the options. And when the speaker starts speaking, your right hand should be near the options and you must be quickly going through the different options and your left hand should be near the question. Then we have label the plan type of question, the important locations in the plan and you have to mark all the important keywords in the different options what they are given. And in case of label the plan, your right hand should be near the options and you must be quickly going through the different options while the speaker is speaking and using your left hand, you must be going through the map. And here you can see in this plan what they have given, they have given the question numbers inside the plan. So this means that so in case of IELTS listening, always the answers will be in order. That means first they will be speaking about the 11th answer, then they will be speaking about the 12th answer, then they will be telling us, us the 13th answer. So in case of plan or map, if the questions are inside the map or the plan, that means they will be in order. The answers will be in order. So when the speaker starts speaking, your right hand should be near the options and you must be quickly going through the different options here when the speaker is speaking and your left hand should be near the map and you must be going through which question they are speaking. For example, they are saying the 11th answer is art collection. So you'll be writing, so you'll be quickly writing it near the option. Then comes sentence completion type of question here also. You'll have to go through the questions. You'll have to mark all the important keywords. For example, the speaker is speaking about the university your fancy should be in that particular sentence and when the speaker is telling the answer you'll have to quickly write the answer and you'll have to follow the speaker then you have short answer type of questions here also you'll have to quickly mark all the important keywords so here also you'll be following the speaker and when you're getting the answer and when the speaker is telling the answer quickly write the answer and you'll be going through the next question and then comes the diagram type of questions in case of diagrams, you'll have to read the heading what they have given. You'll have to look at the, all the important keywords. You'll have to mark all the important keywords. And in case of diagrams, you'll have to quickly mark the order of the questions. For example, here you can see first they have given 23rd, 24th, then you have the 25th question. So in case of diagrams, you'll have to quickly mark the order of the questions. So once the speaker starts speaking, you'll be following what the speaker is telling. You'll be writing the answer. And you'll again follow what the speaker is telling. Write the answer. And you'll have to quickly mark the order of the questions before the speaker starts speaking. So this is about the diagram type of question. So we've clearly discussed all the different question types. I will be solving all the different question types in the test paper. So now we'll be discussing complete the form, question type, matching question, where you can choose the letter more than once. Label the plan, sentence completion, short answer question, and the diagram question. So now we'll be solving all these different question types.
you will hear part of a seminar entitled Understanding the World's Oceans, given by a climate scientist. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25 on pages 5 and 6. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Thanks to all of you for coming along today to hear about how the Robotic Float Project is helping with ocean research. Well, first of all, we'll look at what a robotic float does and its use. So let's start with the device itself. It looks a bit like a cigar and it's about one and a half meters long. More importantly, it's full of equipment that's designed to collect data. So it can help us in building up a profile of different factors which work together within the world's oceans. Sounds like a big project. Isn't it too big for one country to undertake? That's quite true, but this project is a really good example of international cooperation. Over the last five years, scientists from 13 countries have been taking part in the project and launching floats in their area of ocean control. And next year, this number will rise to 14 when Indonesia joins the project. That's impressive. But let's move on to how floats work. The operational cycle goes like this. Each of the floats is dropped in the ocean from a boat at a set point and activated from a satellite. Then the float immediately sinks about 2,000 metres. That's two whole kilometres down in the water. It stays at this depth for about 10 days and is carried around by the currents which operate in the ocean at this level. During this time, it's possible for it to cover quite large distances, but the average is 50 kilometres. So, what is it actually recording? Well, at this stage, nothing. But as it rises to the surface, it collects all sorts of data. Most importantly, variations in salinity, that's salt levels, and the changes in temperature, a bit like underwater weather balloons. Then, when it gets back to the surface, all the data it's collected is beamed up to the satellite. After about five hours on the surface, the float automatically sinks, beginning the whole process again. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30 on page 7. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. What happens to the data? Well, the information is transferred direct to onshore meteorological stations, like our one in Hobart, and within four hours the findings can be on computers, and they can be mapped and analysed. You say you're building models of the world's ocean systems, but how are they going to be used, and more importantly, when? Some of the data has already helped in completing projects. For example, our understanding of the underlying causes of El Nino events is being confirmed by float data. Another way we're using float data is to help us to understand the mechanics of climate change, like global warming and ozone depletion. That's part of an ongoing variability study, but the results are still a long way off. However, this is not the case with our ocean weather forecasting. Because we know from the floats what the prevailing weather conditions will be in certain parts of the ocean, we can advise the Navy on search and rescue missions. That's happening right now, and many yachtsmen owe their lives to the success of this project. In addition, the float data can help us to look at the biological implications of ocean processes. Would that help with preserving fish stocks? Yes, and advising governments on fisheries legislation. We're well on the way to completing a project on this. 
We hope it will help to bring about more sustainable fishing practices. We'll be seeing the results of that quite soon. It sounds like the data from floats has lots of applications. Yes, it does. It's also a powerful agricultural tool. If we were aware of what the weather would be like, say, uh, next year, we could make sure that the farmers planted appropriate grain varieties to produce the best yield from the available rainfall. That sounds a bit like science fiction, <laughs> especially when now we can't even tell them when a drought will break. I agree that this concept is still a long way in the future, but it will come eventually, and the float data will have made a contribution. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. You will hear an extract from a talk given to a group who are going to stay in the UK. Good evening and welcome to the British Council. My name is John Parker and I've been asked to talk to you briefly about certain aspects of life in the UK before you actually go there. So I'm going to talk first about the best ways of making social contacts there. Now you might be wondering why it should be necessary. After all, we meet people all the time. but when you're living in a foreign country, it can be more difficult, not just because of the language, but because customs may be different. If you're going to work in the UK, you will probably be living in private accommodation, so it won't be quite so easy to meet people. But there are still things that you can do to help yourself. First of all, you can get involved in activities in your local community. Join a group of some kind. For example, you'll probably find that there are theatre groups who might be looking for actors, set designers and so on, or if you play an instrument you could join music groups in your area. Or if you like the idea of finding out about local history, there'll be a group for that too. These are just examples. And the best place to get information about things like this are either the town hall or the public library. Libraries in the UK perform quite a broad range of functions nowadays. They're not just confined to lending books, although that's their main role of course. The other thing I wanted to ask you was, did you find it hard studying with the Open University? You mean because you're studying on your own most of the time? Mm. Well, it took me a while to get used to it. I found I needed to maintain a high level of motivation because it's so different from school. There's no one saying, why haven't you written your assignment yet? And that sort of thing. Oh, dear. You'll learn it, Paul. Another thing was that I got very good at time management because I had to fit time for studying around a full-time job. Well, I'm hoping to change to working part-time, so that'll help. Mm. What makes it easier is that the degree is made up of modules, so you can take time off between them if you need to. 
It isn't like a traditional three- or four-year course where you've got to do the whole thing of it in one go. Oh, that's good, because I'd like to spend six months travelling next year. Huh, it's all right for some. <laughs> then, even though you're mostly studying at home, remember you've got tutors to help you, and from time to time there are summer schools. They usually last a week. They're great, because you meet all the other people struggling with the same things as you. Oh. I've made some really good friends that way. Sounds good. Uh, so how do I... We'll hear a telephone conversation between a customer and an agent at a company which ships large boxes overseas. Good morning, Packham's shipping agents. Can I help you? Oh, yes. I'm ringing to make inquiries about sending a large box, uh, a container, back home to Kenya from the UK. Yes, of course. Would you like me to try and find some quotations for you? Yes, that'd be great. Thank you. Well, first of all, I need a few details from you. Fine. Can I take your name? It's Jacob M. Kerry. Can you spell your surname, please? Yes, it's M-K-E-R-E. -E. Is that M for mother? Yes. Thank you. And you say that you will be sending the box to Kenya? That's right. And where would you like the box picked up from? From college, if possible. Yes, of course. I'll take down the address now. It's Westall College. Is that W-E-S-T-A-L-L? -L? Yes, college. Westall College. And where's that? It's Downlands Road in Bristol. Oh, yes, I know it. And the postcode? It's BS89PU. Right. And I need to know the size. Yes. I've measured it carefully, and it's 1.5 metres long. Right. 0 0.75 metres wide. OK. And it's 0 0.5 metres high or, or, or deep. Great. So I'll calculate the volume in a moment and get some quotes for that. But first, can you tell me, you know, very generally, what will be in the box? Yes, uh, th there's mostly clothes. OK. And there's some books. OK, good. Um, anything else? Uh, yes, th there's also some toys. OK, and what is the total value, do you think, of the contents? Well, the main costs are the clothes and the books. They'll be about £1,500. But then the toys are about another 200 so I'd put down £1,700. You'll hear the librarian of a new town library talking to a group of people who are visiting the library. 
Okay, everyone. So, here we are at the entrance to the town library. My name is Anne, and I'm the chief librarian here. And you'll usually find me at the desk just by the main entrance here. So, I'd like to tell you a bit about the way the library is organised and what you'll find where. And you should all have a plan in front of you. Uh, well, as you see, my desk is just on your right as you go in. And opposite this, the first room on your left has an excellent collection of reference books and is also a place where people can read or study peacefully. Just beyond the librarian's desk on the right is a room where we have up-to-date periodicals such as newspapers and magazines. And this room also has a photocopier, in case you want to copy any of the articles. If you carry straight on, you'll come into a large room and this is the main library area. There is fiction in the shelves on the left and non-fiction materials on your right and on the shelves on the far wall, there is an excellent collection of books relating to local history. We're hoping to add a section on local tourist attractions too, later in the year. Through the far door in the library, just past the fiction shelves, is a seminar room, and that can be booked for meetings or talks. And next door to that is the children's library, which has a good collection of stories and picture books for the under-11s. Then there's a large room to the right of the library area. That's the multimedia collection, where you can borrow DVDs and so on. And we also have CD-ROMs you can borrow to use on your computer at home. It was originally the art collection, but that's been moved to another building. And that's about it. Oh, uh, there's also the library office on the left of the librarian's desk. Uh, OK, now, does anyone have any questions? Uh, yes. So in this test paper, we'll be discussing the complete the notes question type, MCQ question type, label the map, MCQ with multiple answers. Matching question. So now we'll be solving all these different question types. Now turn to part one. Part 1. You will hear a man phoning to find out about some children's engineering workshops. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 3. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 3. 
Hello, Children's Engineering Workshops. Oh, hello. I wanted some information about the workshops in the school holidays. Sure. I have two daughters who are interested. The younger one's Lydia. She's four. Do you take children as young as that? Yes. Our tiny engineers workshop is for four to five-year-olds. What sorts of activities do they do? All sorts. For example, they work together to design a special cover that goes round an egg so that when it's inside, they can drop it from a height and it doesn't break. Well, sometimes it does break, but that's part of the fun. Right. And Lydia loves building things. Is there any opportunity for her to do that? Well, they have a competition to see who can make the highest tower. You'd be amazed how high they can go. Right. But they're learning all the time as well as having fun. For example, one thing they do is to design and build a car that's attached to a balloon and the force of the air in that actually powers the car and makes it move along. They go really fast too. OK, well, all this sounds perfect. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 4 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 4 to 10. Now Carly, that's my older daughter, has just had her seventh birthday. So presumably she'd be in a different group. Yes, she'd be in the junior engineers. That's for children from 6 to 8. And do they do the same sorts of activities? Some are the same, but a bit more advanced. So they work out how to build model vehicles. Things like cars and trucks, but also how to construct animals using the same sorts of material and technique. And then they learn how they can program them and make them move. So they learn a bit of coding? They do. They pick it up really quickly. We're there to help if they need it, but they learn from one another too. Right. And do they have competitions too? Yes. With the junior engineers, it's to use recycled materials like card and wood to build a bridge. And the longest one gets a prize. That sounds fun. I wouldn't mind doing that myself. Then they have something a bit different, which is to think up an idea for a five-minute movie and then film it using special animation software. You'd be amazed what they come up with. And of course, that's something they can put on their phone and take home to show all their friends. Exactly. And then they also build a robot in the shape of a human, and they decorate it and program it so that it can move its arms and legs. Perfect. So is it the same price as the tiny engineers? It's just a bit more. Fifty pounds for the five weeks. And are the classes on a Monday too? They used to be, but we found it didn't give our staff enough time to clear up after the first workshop. So we moved them to Wednesdays. The classes are held in the morning from 10 to 11. OK. That's better for me, actually. And um, what about the location? Where exactly are the workshops held? They're in Building 10A. There's a big sign on the door. You can't miss it. And that's in Fradston Industrial Estate. Sorry? Fradston. That's F-R-A-D-S-T. O-N-E. And that's in Grassford, isn't it? Yes, or past the station. And will I have any parking problems there? No, there's always plenty available. So, would you like to enrol Lydia and Carly now? OK. So, can I have your full name? That is the end of part one.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. Good morning everyone and welcome to Stevenson's, one of the country's major manufacturers of metal goods. Thank you for choosing us for your two weeks of work experience. My name is Julia Simmons and since the beginning of this year I've been the managing director. Stevenson's is quite an old company. Like me, the founder, Ronald Stevenson, went into the steel industry when he left school. That was in 1923. He set up this company when he finished his apprenticeship in 1926, although he actually started making plans two years earlier, in 1924. He was a very determined young man. Stevenson's long-term plan was to manufacture components for the machine tools industry, although in fact that never came about, and for the automotive industry, that is cars and lorries. However, there was a delay of five years before that happened, because shortly before the company went into production, Stevenson was given the opportunity to make goods for hospitals and other players in the healthcare industry. So that's what we did for the first five years. Over the years, we've expanded the premises considerably. We were lucky that the site is big enough, so moving to a new location has never been necessary. However, the layout is far from ideal for modern machinery and production methods, so we intend to carry out major refurbishment of this site over the next five years. I'd better give you some idea of what you'll be doing during your two weeks with us, so you know what to expect. Most mornings you'll have a presentation from one of the managers to learn about their department, starting this morning with research and development. And you'll all spend some time in each department, observing what's going on and talking to people, as long as you don't stop them from doing their work altogether. In the past, a teacher from your school has come in at the end of each week to find out how the group were getting on, but your school isn't able to arrange that this year. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. OK, now I'll briefly help you to orientate yourselves around the site. As you can see, we're in the reception area, which we try to make attractive and welcoming to visitors. There's a corridor running left from here, and if you go along that, the door facing you at the end is the entrance to the coffee room. This looks out onto the main road on one side and some trees on the other, and that'll be where you meet each morning. The factory is the very big room on the far side of the site. Next to it is the warehouse, which can be accessed by lorries going up the road to the turning area at the end. You can get to the warehouse by crossing to the far side of the courtyard, and then the door is on your right. Somewhere you'll be keen to find is the staff canteen. This is right next to reception. I can confidently say that the food's very good, but the view isn't. The windows on one side look onto a corridor and courtyard, which aren't very attractive at all, and on the other onto the access road, which isn't much better. You'll be using the meeting room quite often and you'll find it by walking along the corridor to the left of the courtyard and continuing along it to the end. The meeting room is the last one on the right and I'm afraid there's no natural daylight in the room. Then you'll need to know where some of the offices are. 
the Human Resources Department is at the front of this building. So you head to the left along the corridor from reception and it's the second room you come to. It looks out onto the main road. And finally the boardroom where you'll be meeting sometimes. That has quite a pleasant view as it looks out onto the trees. Go along the corridor past the courtyard right to the end. The boardroom is on the left next to the factory. OK, now, are there any questions before we move? That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers to part two. Part 3. You will hear two students called Jess and Tom discussing their art projects. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. How are you getting on with your art project, Tom? OK. Like, they gave us the theme of birds to base our project on, and I'm not really all that interested in wildlife, but I'm starting to get into it. I've pretty well finished the introductory stage. So have I. When they gave us all those handouts with details of books and websites to look at, I was really put off. But the more I read, the more interested I got. Mm, me too. I found I could research so many different aspects of birds in art. Colour, movement, texture. So I was looking forward to the bird park visit. What a letdown. It poured with rain and we hardly saw a single bird much less use than the trip to the Natural History Museum. Yeah. I liked all the stuff about evolution there. The workshop sessions with Dr Fletcher were good too, especially the brainstorming sessions. Ah, oh, I missed those because I was ill. I wish we could have seen the projects last year's students did. Hmm, I suppose they want us to do our own thing, not copy. Have you drafted your proposal yet? Yes, but I haven't handed it in. I need to amend some parts. I've realised the notes from my research are almost all just descriptions. I haven't actually evaluated anything, so I'll have to fix that. Oh, I didn't know we had to do that. I'll have to look at that too. Did you do a timeline for the project? Yes, and a mind map. Yeah, so did I. I quite enjoyed that. But it was hard having to explain the basis for my decisions in my action plan. What? You know, give a rationale. I didn't realise we had to do that. OK, I can add it now. And I've done the video diary presentation and worked out what I want my outcome to be in the project. Someone told me it's best not to be too precise about your actual outcome at this stage, so you have more scope to explore your ideas later on. So I'm going to go back to my proposal to make it a bit more vague. Really? OK, I'll change that too then. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30.
One part of the project I'm unsure about is where we choose some paintings of birds and say what they mean to us. Like, I chose a painting of a falcon by Landseer. I like it because the bird's standing there with his head turned to one side, but he seems to be staring straight at you. But I can't just say it's a bit scary, can I? Hmm. You could talk about the possible danger suggested by the bird's look. Oh, OK. There's a picture of a fish hawk by Audubon I like. It's swooping over the water with a fish in its talons and with great black wings which take up most of the picture. So you could discuss it in relation to predators and food chains? Well, actually, I think I'll concentrate on the impression of rapid motion it gives. Right. Do you know that picture of a kingfisher by Van Gogh? It's perching on a reed growing near a stream. Yes, it's got these beautiful blue and red and black shades. Mm -hmm. I've actually chosen it because I saw a real kingfisher once when I was little. I was out walking with my grandfather and I've never forgotten it. Oh, so we can use a personal link? Sure. OK. There's a portrait called William Wells. I can't remember the artist. But it's a middle-aged man who's just shot a bird. And his expression and the way he's holding the bird in his hand suggests he's not sure about what he's done. To me, it's about how ambiguous people are in the way they exploit the natural world. Interesting. There's Gauguin's picture, Vira Matti. He did it in Tahiti. It's a woman with a white bird behind her that is eating a lizard. And what I'm interested in is what idea this bird refers to. Apparently, it's a reference to the never-ending cycle of existence. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I chose a portrait of a little boy, Giovanni de' Medici. He's holding a tiny bird in one fist. I like the way he's holding it carefully so he doesn't hurt it. Oh, right. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers to part three. Part 4. You will hear a professor of philosophy giving a talk on the ancient philosophy of Stoicism. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Ancient philosophy is not just about talking or lecturing or even reading long, dense books. In fact, it is something people have used throughout history to solve their problems and to achieve their greatest triumphs. Specifically, I am referring to Stoicism which in my opinion is the most practical of all philosophies and therefore the most appealing. Stoicism was founded in ancient Greece by Zeno of Citium in the early 3rd century BC, but was practiced by the likes of Epictetus, Cato, Seneca and Marcus Aurelius. Amazingly, we still have access to these ideas 
despite the fact that the most famous Stoics never wrote anything down for publication. Cato definitely didn't. Marcus Aurelius never intended his meditations to be anything but personal. Seneca's letters were, well, letters, and Epictetus's thoughts come to us by way of a note-taking student. Stoic principles were based on the idea that its followers could have an unshakable happiness in this life, and the key to achieving this was virtue. The road to virtue, in turn, lay in understanding that destructive emotions like anger and jealousy are under our conscious control. They don't have to control us, because we can learn to control them. In the words of Epictetus, external events I cannot control, but the choices I make with regard to them I do control. The modern-day philosopher and writer Nassim Nicholas Taleb defines a Stoic as someone who has a different perspective on experiences which most of us would see as wholly negative. A Stoic transforms fear into caution, pain into transformation, mistakes into initiation, and desire into undertaking. Using this definition as a model, we can see that throughout the centuries, Stoicism has been practiced in more recent history by kings, presidents, artists, writers, and entrepreneurs. The founding fathers of the United States were inspired by the philosophy. George Washington was introduced to Stoicism by his neighbours at age 17, and later put on a play based on the life of Cato to inspire his men. Thomas Jefferson kept a copy of Seneca beside his bed. Writers and artists have also been inspired by the Stoics. Eugene Delacroix, the renowned French Romantic artist known best for his painting Liberty Leading the People, was an ardent Stoic, referring to it as his consoling religion. The economist Adam Smith's theories on capitalism were significantly influenced by the Stoicism that he studied as a schoolboy, under a teacher who had translated Marcus Aurelius's works. Today's political leaders are no different, with many finding their inspiration from the ancient texts. Former US President Bill Clinton rereads Marcus Aurelius every single year, and many have compared former President Obama's calm leadership style to that of Cato. Wen Jiaobao, the former Prime Minister of China, claims that Meditations is one of two books he travels with, and that he has read it more than 100 times over the course of his life. Stoicism had a profound influence on Albert Ellis, who invented cognitive behaviour therapy which is used to help people manage their problems by changing the way that they think and behave. It's most commonly used to treat depression. The idea is that we can take control of our lives by challenging the irrational beliefs that create our faulty thinking, symptoms and behaviours by using logic instead. Stoicism has also become popular in the world of business. Stoic principles can build the resilience and state of mind required to overcome setbacks, because Stoics teach turning obstacles into opportunity, a lesson every business entrepreneur needs to learn. I would argue that studying Stoicism is as relevant today as it was 2,000 years ago, thanks to its brilliant insights into how to lead a good life. At the very root of the thinking, there is a very simple way of living. Control what you can, and accept what you can't. This is not as easy as it sounds, and will require considerable practice. It can take a lifetime to master. The Stoics also believed the most important foundation for a good and happy life is not money, fame, power or pleasure, but having a disciplined and principled character. 
something which seems to resonate with many people today. That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Now we'll be solving a complete test paper. So in case of IELTS listening, there will be four parts. Part 1, Part 2, Part 3 and Part 4. So when the Part 1 is completed, there will give us 30 seconds to go through the answers. So in that 30 seconds, we'll be utilizing those 30 seconds to go through the different questions which they have given and we'll be using that time to mark all the important keywords. And at the end, we'll have 10 minutes to transfer the answers into the answer sheet. We'll be quickly checking for the word limit. So you'll have to quickly check whether you have written one word or not. And in some questions, you're not supposed to write numbers. So you'll be checking whether you've written any number or not. Map type of question, you'll have to quickly write those answers here. In case of map or the plan, you'll have to clearly write the answers here. And in case of matching type of questions, also you'll be quickly writing the answers here. For example, we've written the, call the first and second answer. And the first answer is D. And the second answer is G. So you'll be quickly writing it here. First answer is D. Second answer is G. So you'll be quickly going through whatever you have written and then you'll be transferring these answers into your listening answer sheet and you'll have to write it in capital letters in the answer sheet. So you'll be given 10 minutes to transfer the answers into the answer sheet. So within the first one minute, this is very, very important. Within the first one minute itself, we'll have to check all your answers. We'll have to check for the word limit. We'll have to check whether you can write the numbers or not. We'll have to check the spellings. And in case of matching type of questions, we'll have to write all the answers clearly next to the questions. And in case of plan or map type of question, we will have to write the answers clearly next to the question. So this is the test paper four. So now we'll be solving this test paper completely. This is the IELTS listening test. You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four parts. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Now turn to part one. Part one. You will hear a man phoning the owner of a holiday cottage. First, you have some time to look at questions one to six.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Hello? Oh, hello. I was hoping to speak to Jack Fitzgerald about renting a cottage. I'm his wife, Shirley, and we own the cottages together, so I'm sure I can help you. Great. My name's Tom. Some friends of ours rented Granary Cottage from you last year, and they thought it was great. So my wife and I are hoping to come in May for a week. What date did you have in mind? The week beginning the 14th, if possible. I'll just check. I'm sorry, Tom, it's already booked that week. It's free the week beginning the 28th, though, for seven nights. In fact, that's the only time you could have it in May. Oh, well, we could manage that, I think. We'd just need to change a couple of things. How much would it cost? That's the beginning of high season, so it'd be £550 for the week. Ah, that's a bit more than we wanted to pay, I'm afraid. We've budgeted up to £500 for accommodation. Well, we've just finished converting another building into a cottage, which we're calling Cherville Cottage. Sorry, what was that again? Cherville. C H E R V for Victor I L. Oh, that's a herb, isn't it? That's right. It grows fairly wild around here. You could have that for the week you want for £480. OK. So could you tell me something about it, please? Of course. The building was built as a garage. It's a little smaller than Granary Cottage. So that must sleep two people as well? That's right. There's a double bedroom. Does it have a garden? Yes, you get to it from the living room through French doors. And we provide two deck chairs. We hope to build a patio in the near future, but I wouldn't like to guarantee it'll be finished by May. OK. The front door opens onto the old farmyard, and parking isn't a problem. There's plenty of room at the front for that. There are some trees and potted plants there. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. What about facilities in the cottage? It has standard things like a cooker and fridge, I presume. In the kitchen area, there's a fridge freezer, and we've just put in an electric cooker. Is there a washing machine? Yes. There's also a TV in the living room, which plays DVDs too. The bathroom is too small for a bath, so there's a shower instead. I think a lot of people prefer that nowadays anyway. It's more environmentally friendly, isn't it? Unless you spend half the day in it. <laughs> exactly. What about heating? It sometimes gets quite cool at that time of year. There's central heating, and if you want to light a fire, there's a stove. We can provide all the wood you need for it. It smells so much nicer than coal, and it makes the room very cosy. We've got one in our own house. That sounds very pleasant. Perhaps we should come in the winter to make the most of it. Yes. We find we don't want to go out when we've got the fire burning. There are some attractive views from the cottage, which I haven't mentioned. There's a famous stone bridge. It's one of the oldest in the region, and you can see it from the living room. It isn't far away. The bedroom window looks in the opposite direction and has a lovely view of the hills and the monument at the top. Well, that all sounds perfect. I'd like to book it, please. Would you want a deposit? Yes. We ask for 30% to secure your booking. So that'll be uh, £144. And when would you like the rest of the money? You're coming in May. 
So, the last day of March, please. Fine. Excellent. Could I just take your details so that I... That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers to part one. Part 2. You will hear a town councillor reporting on the local transport network and a recreation facility. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. Right, next on the agenda we have traffic and highways. Councillor Thornton. Thank you. Well, we now have the results of the survey carried out last month about traffic and road transport in the town. People were generally satisfied with the state of the roads. There were one or two complaints about potholes, which will be addressed but a significant number of people complained about the increasing number of heavy vehicles using our local roads to avoid traffic elsewhere. We'd expected more complaints by commuters about the reduction in the train service, but it doesn't seem to have affected people too much. The cycle path that runs alongside the river is very well used by both cyclists and pedestrians since the surface was improved last year, but overtaking can be a problem so we're going to add a bit on the side to make it wider. At some stage, we'd like to extend the path so that it goes all the way through the town, but that won't be happening in the immediate future. The plans to have a pedestrian crossing next to the post office have unfortunately had to be put on hold for the time being. We budgeted for this to be done this financial year, but then there were rumours that the post office was going to move which would have meant there wasn't really a need for a crossing. Now they've confirmed that they're staying where they are, but the highways department have told us that it would be dangerous to have a pedestrian crossing where we'd originally planned it, as there's a bend in the road there, so that'll need some more thought. On Station Road, near the station and level crossing, drivers can face quite long waits if the level crossing's closed, and we've now got signs up requesting them not to leave their engines running at that time. This means pedestrians waiting on the pavement to cross the railway line don't have to breathe in car fumes. We've had some problems with cyclists leaving their bikes chained to the railings outside the ticket office, but the station has agreed to provide bike racks there. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. So next on the agenda is proposals for improvements to the recreation ground. Councillor Thornton again. Well, since we managed to extend the recreation ground, we've spent some time talking to local people about how it could be made a more attractive and useful space. If you have a look at the map up on the screen, you can see the river up in the north 
and the community hall near the entrance from the road. At present, cars can park between the community hall and that line of trees to the east, but this is quite dangerous for pedestrians, so we're suggesting a new car park on the opposite side of the community hall, right next to it. We also have a new location for the cricket pitch. As we've now purchased additional space to the east of the recreation ground, beyond the trees, we plan to move it away from its current location, which is rather near the road, into this new area beyond the line of trees. This means there's less danger of stray balls hitting cars or pedestrians. We've got plans for a children's playground, which will be accessible by a footpath from the community hall and will be alongside the river. We'd originally thought of having it close to the road, but we think this will be a more attractive location. The skateboard ramp is very popular with both younger and older children. We had considered moving this up towards the river, but in the end we decided to have it in the southeast corner near the road. The pavilion is very well used at present by both football players and cricketers. It will stay where it is now, to the left of the line of trees and near to the river, handy for both the football and cricket pitches. And finally, we'll be getting a new notice board for local information, and that will be directly on people's right as they go from the road into the recreation ground. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers to part two. Part 3. You will hear two urban planning students discussing bike sharing schemes in different cities. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Now that we've done all the research into bike sharing schemes in cities around the world, we need to think about how we're going to organise our report. Right. I think we should start by talking about the benefits. I mean, it's great that so many cities have introduced these schemes where anyone can pick up a bike from dozens of different locations and hire it for a few hours. It makes riding a bike very convenient for people. Yes, but the costs can add up and that puts people on low incomes off in some places. Mm, I suppose so. But if it means more people in general are cycling rather than driving, then because they're increasing the amount of physical activity they do, it's good for their health. OK, but isn't that of less importance? I mean, doesn't the impact of reduced emissions on air pollution have a more significant effect on people's health? Certainly in some cities, bike sharing has made a big contribution to that and also help to cut the number of cars on the road significantly. Which is the main point. Exactly. But I'd say it's had less of an impact on noise pollution because there are still loads of buses and lorries around. Right. Shall we quickly discuss the recommendations we're going to make? In order to ensure bike sharing schemes are successful? Yes. OK. Well, while I think it's nice to have really state-of-the-art bikes with things like GPS, I wouldn't say they're absolutely necessary. But some technical things are really important, like a fully functional app so people can make payments and book bikes easily. Places which haven't invested in that have really struggled. Good point. Some people say there shouldn't be competing companies offering separate bike sharing schemes, but in some really big cities, competition's beneficial. And anyway, one company might not be able to manage the whole thing. Right. 
deciding how much to invest is a big question. The cities which have opened loads of new bike lanes, at the same time as introducing bike-sharing schemes, have generally been more successful. But there are examples of successful schemes where this hasn't happened. What does matter, though, is having a big publicity campaign. Definitely. If people don't know how to use the scheme, or don't understand its benefits, they won't use it. People need a lot of persuasion to stop using their cars. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. Shall we look at some examples now and say what we think is good or bad about them? I suppose we should start with Amsterdam, as this was one of the first cities to have a bike-sharing scheme. Yes, there was already a strong culture of cycling here. In a way, it's strange that there was such a demand for bike-sharing because you'd have thought most people would have used their own bikes. And yet it's one of the best used schemes. Dublin's an interesting example of a success story. It must be because the public transport system's quite limited. Not really. There's no underground, but there are trams and a good bus network. I'd say price has a lot to do with it. It's one of the cheapest schemes in Europe to join. But the buses are really slow. Anyway, the weather certainly can't be a factor. No, definitely not. The London scheme's been quite successful. Yes, it's been a really good thing for the city. The bikes are popular and the whole system is well maintained, but it isn't expanding quickly enough. Basically, not enough's been spent on increasing the number of cycle lanes. Hopefully that'll change. Yes. Now, what about outside Europe? Well, bike-sharing schemes have taken off in places like Buenos Aires. Hmm. They built a huge network of cycle lanes to support the introduction of the scheme there, didn't they? It attracted huge numbers of cyclists, where previously there were hardly any. An example of good planning. Absolutely. New York is a good example of how not to introduce a scheme. When they launched it, it was more than ten times the price of most other schemes. More than it costs to take a taxi. Crazy. I think the organisers lacked vision and ambition there. I think so too. Sydney would be a good example to use. I would have expected it to have grown pretty quickly here. Yes. I can't quite work out why it hasn't been an instant success like some of the others. It's a shame, really. I know. OK, so now we've thought about all the... That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers to part three. Part 4. You will hear part of an environmental science lecture about a large bird called the dodo, which is now extinct. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. One of the most famous cases of extinction is that of a bird known as the dodo. In fact, there's even a saying in English, as dead as the dodo, used to refer to something which no longer exists. But for many centuries, the dodo was alive and well, although it could only be found in one place, the island of Mauritius in the Indian Ocean. It was a very large bird, about one metre tall, and over the centuries it had lost the ability to fly, but it survived happily under the trees that covered the island. Then, in the year 1507, the first Portuguese ships stopped at the island. The sailors were carrying spices back to Europe and found the island a convenient stopping place where they could stock up with food and water for the rest of the voyage, but they didn't settle on Mauritius. However, in 1638, the Dutch arrived and set up a colony there. These first human inhabitants of the island found the dodo birds a convenient source of meat, although not everyone liked the taste. It's hard to get an accurate description of what the dodo actually looked like. We do have some written records from sailors and a few pictures, but we don't know how reliable these are. The best known picture is a Dutch painting in which the bird appears to be extremely fat, but this may not be accurate. An Indian painting done at the same time shows a much thinner bird. Although attempts were made to preserve the bodies of some of the birds, no complete specimen survives. In the early 17th century, four dried parts of a bird were known to exist. Of these, three have disappeared so only one example of soft tissue from the dodo survives, a dodo head. Bones have also been found, but there's only one complete skeleton in existence. This single dodo skeleton has recently been the subject of scientific research, which suggests that many of the earlier beliefs about dodos may have been incorrect. For example, early accounts of the birds mention how slow and clumsy it was, but scientists now believe the birds' strong knee joints would have made it capable of movement which was not slow, but actually quite fast. In fact, one 17th century sailor wrote that he found the birds hard to catch. It's true that the dodo's small wings wouldn't have allowed it to leave the ground, but the scientists suggest that these were probably employed for balance while going over uneven ground. Another group of scientists carried out analysis of the dodo's skull. They found that the reports of the lack of intelligence of the dodo were not borne out by their research, which suggested the bird's brain was not small, but average in size. In fact, in relation to its body size, it was similar to that of the pigeon, which is known to be a highly intelligent bird. The researchers also found that the structure of the bird's skull suggested that one sense which was particularly well developed was that of smell. So the dodo may also have been particularly good at locating ripe fruit and other food in the island's thick vegetation. So it looks as if the dodo was better able to survive and defend itself than was originally believed. Yet, less than 200 years after Europeans first arrived on the island, they had become extinct. So what was the reason for this? 
For a long time, it was believed that the dodos were hunted to extinction. But scientists now believe the situation was more complicated than this. Another factor may have been the new species brought to the island by the sailors. These included dogs, which would have been a threat to the dodos, and also monkeys, which ate the fruit that was the main part of the dodo's diet. These were brought to the island deliberately. But the ships also brought another type of creature, rats, which came to land from the ships and rapidly overran the island. These upset the ecology of the island, not just the dodos, but other species too. However, they were a particular danger to the dodos because they consumed their eggs. And since each dodo only laid one at a time, this probably had a devastating effect on populations. However, we now think that probably the main cause of the bird's extinction was not the introduction of non-native species, but the introduction of agriculture. This meant that the forest that had once covered all the island and that had provided a perfect home for the dodo was cut down so that crops such as sugar could be grown. So, although the dodo had survived for thousands of years, suddenly it was gone. That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four.